You're strapped into the cockpit of a $100 million fighter jet soaring through the sky at twice the speed of sound. Suddenly, alarms blare. Your aircraft is failing. In seconds, you must decide. Stay with the plane or eject. This is the reality for fighter pilots worldwide. Ejection seats have saved over 7,000 lives since their introduction. But here's the kicker. Cause we want retribution. Oh yeah, we want retribution. Pulling that handle is far from a guarantee of survival. When ejection seats were first introduced in the 1940s, they were a revolutionary concept. But as one test pilot put it, it was like being shot out of a cannon into a brick wall. Today's seats are technological marvels, capable of saving lives even when a plane is on the ground, stationary. But the risks, they're still monumentally high. But how do these high-tech lifesavers actually work? When a pilot pulls the ejection handle, it sets off an explosive cartridge, launching the seat up a rail and out of the aircraft with incredible force. In just fractions of a second, the canopy is jettisoned and a rocket motor ignites, propelling the seat and pilot clear of the doomed aircraft. A drogue chute deploys to stabilize the seat's fall, followed by the main parachute. When you eject, you're subjecting your body to forces up to 20 times that of gravity. It's like having a small car dropped on your spine. Speaking of which, spinal compression injuries are the most common and severe risk. We're talking fractured vertebrae, herniated discs, and chronic back pain that can last a lifetime. Some pilots have even lost inches in height permanently, but that's just the beginning. As you rocket out of the cockpit, you're facing a smorgasbord of potential injuries, neck and head trauma, including whiplash and concussions, limb fractures from flailing arms and legs, facial injuries from wind blast at high speeds, eye damage from debris, and let's not forget about the parachute. If it fails to deploy or gets damaged, you're in for a very bad day. It was incredibly violent says Captain Brian Udell, who survived the fastest known ejection at approximately 780 miles per hour in 1995. The force was like hitting a brick wall. Despite his severe injuries, he emphasizes, my training and the reliability of my equipment were crucial to my survival. It was nothing short of a miracle. It felt like somebody had just hit me with a train when I went out into the wind stream. It ripped my helmet right off of my head broke all the blood vessels in my head and face. My head was swollen the size of a basketball and my lips were the size of cucumbers. Now you might be thinking, surely with all our advanced technology, these seats must be pretty safe, right? Well, yes and no. Modern ejection seats boast survival rates exceeding 90% under optimal conditions. However, optimal conditions are rarely the reality in emergency situations. Furthermore, surviving to see another day doesn't account for the physical and psychological costs one might endure for years after, if not for a lifetime. Lieutenant Nick Richardson of the Royal Navy, who ejected over the Adriatic Sea in 1994, describes it as a surreal and overwhelming experience, with a rapid transition from being in control of the aircraft to parachuting into the sea. He adds, my training kicked in instinctively, helping me manage the shock and execute survival procedures effectively. And remember, even if you survive the ejection, you're not out of the woods yet. You could be facing, in addition to the physical toll, an exposure to toxic chemicals from seat propellants, lack of oxygen on high altitude, risk of being captured over enemy territories, moral decisions of unmanned plane hitting civilians areas, extreme bad weather, drowning with the seat when landing over open sea, parachute malfunction, and the biggest of them all, the post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. This is why pilot training is so intense. They're not just learning to fly, they're preparing for the possibility that one day they might have to abandon their multi-million dollar aircraft in seconds. There's even an exclusive club for those who have survived parachuting from disabled aircraft, the Caterpillar Club. Its symbol, a tiny gold Caterpillar pin representing the silk threads of early parachutes. But here's a sobering twist in our story. Despite surviving the harrowing experience of ejection, many pilots never returned to the skies they once commanded. The harsh reality is that only about 50% of pilots who eject ever make it back to the cockpit. For the other half, their careers, and often their lives, are irrevocably altered. 
For many, the dream of flight becomes a grounded reality. Chronic pain, PTSD, and medical disqualifications keep them earthbound. The very system designed to save their lives often ends up changing those lives forever. The military does offer retraining and support, but for those who've tasted the freedom of the skies, a desk job can feel like a prison. The transition is often brutal, leaving many struggling with depression and a lost sense of identity. Even those who do return carry invisible burdens. Captain Udell reflects, the risks are high and now I understand the true cost. It's not just about serving your country, it's about what you're willing to sacrifice. Preparation and resilience are key, but the experience stays with you forever. So the next time you see a fighter jet streaking across the sky, remember this. Those pilots aren't just flying an aircraft, they're sitting on a controlled explosion, ready to be deployed at a moment's notice.